Thank you for joining us today. We're here with uh, Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland um, to talk about uh, the challenges we face as a country uh, grappling with the COVID pandemic and some of the things that Maryland has done to deal with their epidemic of COVID spread. This is really an unprecedented time of a global pandemic. The intelligence community had long warned us about the uh, risks of a pandemic and put it on par with the risks from weapons of mass destruction and counterterrorism and uh, cyber attack. Uh, but as much as we thought we were prepared for this as a nation, we've found going through this episode that we really didn't have all the preparations that we thought we had. And we've been unable to find as a nation uh, a medium between allowing this virus to spread in a way that's causing a lot of death and suffering and strict lockdown, something that's acceptable to enough people that we can implement some kind of an approach that enough people um, find socially and culturally and economically as acceptable. And so we're continuing to see spread around the nation, particularly in the South right now. Maryland is among states that have grappled with epidemic spread and managed to really crush the epidemic and bring virus levels down. And so I wanted to talk to the governor today about the things that he did to try to control the epidemic here in the state, restart a lot of the activity in the state, try to bring back to Marylanders what was important to them with respect to trying to open schools and restart the economy uh, and do the things that are important to people and preserve those things that are important to people, even amidst uh, continued risk from this epidemic and the risk that it comes back at some point this fall. So Governor, thank you for joining us. I wanna start with a question just generally. What do you think is going to evolve? What are you looking at with respect to the fall? What do you think the risks are right now? Well, first of all, Dr. Godley, let, let me just thank you for, uh, for uh, hosting here today. I wanna thank AEI. It's a real honor to be here with you. Um, uh, thank you for your service and giving us advice throughout this entire thing and serving on our coronavirus task force. It's been invaluable. And I think you're obviously uh, one of the most important voices and leaders in this entire pandemic. So thank you for everything you've done. It's been a, it's been a pleasure working with you. Look forward to the discussion today. Um, I, I think as we move forward, we're, we're concerned as everybody else is looking at what's happening around the rest of the country. Um, we've really, we were very early and aggressive in trying to go after this. Thanks to the advice from smart people like you and AEI's plan that they put out uh, early on. We took a lot of that advice from people like some of our friends from Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland, some smart, some smart doctors and epidemiologists and public health uh, uh, officials. Um, and we took early and aggressive action that I think really did help dampen the curve. And luckily, so far, our numbers are looking pretty good. Our positivity rate has actually been relatively flat and on a slightly declining level for at least three weeks now. Um, uh, we're uh, better than what's going on in a lot of places, but we're very concerned about seeing the spikes in places all around the, uh, the country. We're not immune to that. And we're, you know, this virus doesn't recognize borders. We're concerned about how this might spread into the fall especially as we uh, think about not only how do we restart our economy, how do we get kids back to learning again and back into schools if we can do it in a safe way, and uh, how this is gonna affect us when we run into the confluence with the uh, flu season. So it's, uh, you know, as you know, nowhere near behind us, and we're gonna be struggling with, with this for a long time. Can you talk a little bit about what Marilyn did to try to get the, um the levels down, what you think this state did that was successful? And were there any things that you did in this state that was different than um, what some other states might have done that you know would be sort of lessons learned? I'm not sure if we did things that were that different. We may have taken action quicker than some other states and been a little bit more aggressive. Um, I, the very first day that we got our very first case, first of all, I think we started watching this in early in January when we first started hearing about what was going on in China. Um, we had a great, I, I lead the National Governors Association in February, we had a really great presentation from some of the federal government's top experts who kind of gave us a, an a awareness of what might be happening, advised the governors. And then we, we were watching it. And on top of it, our whole team, our emergency management professionals, our, uh, our, our whole cabinet and our health department was ready and trying to be prepared in advance. And when our first case broke out, in March, I immediately, uh, within hours, declared a state of emergency. Uh, and it set off a, a, a succession of, I think, maybe 40 executive orders, uh, rolling back and tightening down things to try to, every time we got advice about what could help us save lives and keep people safe, we took those actions quickly. 
I think I was the first or maybe Governor DeWine in Ohio and I simultaneously closed our schools. We were the first ones to do so. Uh, we, 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 we took action to first shut down uh, casinos and large events and then restaurants and bars and then, uh, you know, stay at home order and uh, masking and all those kinds of things. Um, and then we had a safe, which you helped us uh, come up with really good advice on, uh, a safe, gradual and effective reopening plan that still kept many of those things in place. And now we've had our economy open. 98% uh, of our economy is allowed to open, but in a safe, manageable way. Um, we kept all of our essential businesses open throughout uh, this pandemic. And while obviously it's impacted us economically, we're doing much better economically than most other states as well. Our unemployment rate is 8%. And many states are at 23 or 25%. You talk about that meeting um, that you pulled together for the National Governors Association where you brought in those experts in February. That was early, early on. Uh, yeah, first week in February. People, right, before a lot of people were focused on this. Um, what inspired you to do that? What was the mood in that meeting? Uh, sort of in the meeting and coming out of it, did that, was that a, a key moment? It, it, was, it was interesting. So, you know, we have a, a couple of days where all the governors descend on Washington. Right. Um, and it's the annual winter meeting of the National Governors Association. We had, we had almost all the governors here, maybe 48 of the governors or, or so. Uh, and we had a full agenda. This was not on the agenda, but we squeezed it in uh, because we, let's get this emergency meeting in. Um, and we had uh, Dr. Uh, Redfield, we had uh, Anthony Fauci, and we had a, you know, a couple of other key leaders from the, from the administration come in to talk to us. It was right before we had to switch into tuxedos to go to the White House dinner that night, uh, which is an annual event. Uh, and everybody was kind of complaining about, we can't do another meeting, we've got to go take a shower, you know, change clothes, get our, get our spouses and you know, get ready to go to this dinner. Uh, but you know, we stressed how important this was going to be. I can tell you when we heard from these experts at the federal level, what we were going to be faced with. So as they talked about, this is potentially more contagious than SARS, that the death toll could be, you know, really bad, <laughs> that this is going to be spreading like wildfire, that this is what you're going to be faced with. At the time, I think we had just had the cases in, in the state of Washington. We just heard the news about the outbreak in the first nursing home that was all over the television, but it wasn't yet spread across right. the country. And every governor, most of the governors, I think, left that day, left that meeting uh, somewhat shocked, but very aware and very concerned about, we've got to take immediate action. I know I came back the, the, to my office the day after that. We'd already been working on it for a month or so and said, you know, we are going into high gear. Yeah. You've talked about the challenges you wrote in the Washington Post recently about some of the challenges and in your book as well, um, getting testing services into states, into the country. This state's done better than a lot of other states. You're testing about 25,000 people a day. It's continuing to ramp. You're building out a facility in the University of Maryland to do additional testing. What do you think we could be doing at a national level? What should we be doing that you don't see happening right now that could better support the states and the labs sure. to get more testing as we head into the fall? Because to your point, when this collides with flu season, everyone who has any kind of uh, flu-like symptoms, febrile illness is now going to need to get ruled out for COVID. So we're going to even put more strain on testing. Right. So there was an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, a few days ago. It really wasn't about to the current story. It was an excerpt from the book right. talking about the early stages of this uh, pandemic, where I think we could have taken more steps to develop a national testing strategy, but um, I, we, um, I think they've, we've done a better job of, of getting testing ramped up, not only in our state, but across the country. But now we're running into problems again, where our states are having shortages, because there's lines where the labs are so overloaded that they're taking up to 10 days or even longer to get tests back. That's almost worthless. I mean, you can't, you can't really make decisions based on somebody that, that got the, you know, found positive 10 days late. So we here developed a long-term testing strategy back in April. We acquired a massive kind of st a strategic stockpile of tests and ramped up to 230 other uh, opportunity labs and other facilities all over our state. Uh, and we're, we have a plan to last us through the fall uh, strategically because we're concerned. Our lab, we built our own lab at the University of Maryland with state-of-the-art robotics utilizing these Korean tests that we've acquired. Uh, that we're much faster. So we can turn around our tests when we need to on these outbreaks and clusters in 24 hours, maybe 48 hours at the latest, where we're seeing private labs backed up for 10 days or two weeks. I'm concerned, though, that we're going to have to keep working so we don't have these issues in the fall when the flu season comes out. 
You say um, so ch chapter 38 uh, titled Global Pandemic, you observe the following uh, that following your declaration to the leaders of Maryland's 24 counties that the pandemic is, quote, is going to be the most important challenge of our lives. You specifically remark, quote, as diverse a group as we are, Republicans, Democrats, urban, rural and suburban, every one of these local leaders could feel the weight of the moment. We were all in this together, even if none of us knew exactly what this was. There was just so much to be done. Um, we've seen a lot of shifts in the public mood over the uh, in this country over the last decade or so. Um, we've seen a lot of shifts more recently as a result of, uh, of the pandemic that we're grappling with. Um, what do you think the majority of voters are looking for now? How has this pandemic sort of reshaped the public mood, if, if you will? Well, it's a great question. Uh, look, I think uh, this 2020 has been um, you know, the most difficult year that uh, any of us have probably gone through, everybody in America. Um, it's really challenged leaders at the federal, state, and local level, level but it's really challenged everyday Americans, that, uh, small business owners, people who've lost their jobs, people who've gone through the tragedy of losing a loved one or going through this, fighting this illness. It's impacted almost every aspect of, of society, and it's going to continue to do so for quite some time. I believe it's going to continue through the fall and into early next year until we can get a vaccine. None of us really ever expected to go through this. Uh, it's the biggest challenge I know I've ever had to deal with, and I've been through some challenges before. Um, but I, I think um, you know how we deal with this crisis is going to be a, a defining moment for America, and it really is going to take everybody at the federal, state, and local level and the private sector all working together. Uh, to try to come out of this and, and bring our economy back and, and get the health crisis under control. You, I, I want to um, just touch on the book again, if I may. A, a, a very clear theme in the book is the importance of transparency. So on page uh, 293, you note, quote, we got overwhelming public support after shutting down the indoor dining gyms and movie theaters, uh, quote, because we were so clear in explaining the reasons for this drastic action, unquote, and you appreciated the importance of unfiltered truth to the people of Maryland. Um, you know, you received from government officials in your initial briefing on page 281, and then again on page 370, you talk about leveling with the American, the Maryland people, explaining, quote, the way we go about our daily lives and the way we work is going to be significantly different to, to pretend otherwise just wouldn't be honest. What can you say if you were giving advice to other leaders about the importance of this kind of candor in, in sort of a moment of crisis, leveling with people, not just about what you know, trying to call on collective action, but also, you know, what we don't know, which was a lot of things with respect to COVID. Well, I, you know, I think it's probably uh, one of the, one of the most important things in a time like this, uh, when uh, people, there's so much uncertainty and the American people, you know, people are scared. They're worried about what the future is and they have so many questions and they, they're looking to leaders uh, and they're looking to smart people like you who know much more about these diseases than they do to give them clear, unfiltered advice and guidance, and they want the facts as directly as possible. Even if, they're, even if you're delivering you know, bad news or things that they don't wanna hear, I think it's just important to be as frank and direct and open as possible. And I've, I've said, and not just to be critical because, uh, but I've said to, to, to the president and to, to the, I've, I've said, and one of the things I think, one of the mistakes that they've made is just not communicating clearly. We'd have a great discussion with some of the top leaders in the administration, the vice president leading the coronavirus task force. And then the president would say something almost completely opposite to what all of them were saying. And I've said that, you know, that, that communicating is essential, uh, particularly in a crisis. You know, I've tried to be very uh, straightforward and direct all the time, uh, but in a crisis, it's even more important. January 19th um, of this year was the day that uh, they announced in Wuhan that the cases had gone from 50 to 200. And it was a turning point of sorts. I remember the day, I remember where I was. I remember the phone calls I made right after that because it was the first time that the Chinese also said that they believe there's a sustained human to human transmission. So it was the first time we had evidence that there was transmission between people. And that Monday, I believe it was, they actually announced that about a dozen or so doctors had been infected, which is always an wow. indication that there's human to human transmission. We're almost exactly six months from that point, which is remarkable that it's that short of a period of time. It and sure seems longer. Exactly. It? <laughs> it feels longer. And, and, it, and sort of, I think it reinforces how much we don't know. We're only six months into this with a novel virus. Given all the uncertainty, everyone wants to send their kids back to school. You're focused on that. 
Um, we recognize the importance of getting kids back into the classroom. How are you grappling with that, trying to get kids back in school, but do it safely, given the fact that there's a lot of unknowns, including with respect to children? I think it's probably one of the biggest, you know, we've had to make so many, first of all, I agree. It doesn't seem like six months. It seems like three years have gone by in that six months. Uh, it's amazing how much has happened since then. We still don't know all the answers. We don't know the end is not in sight um, and we don't know what's gonna happen next. Um, but given all the weight of all the decisions we've had to make, uh, this is one of the most difficult, I think, is about how do we get our kids back to school safely? How, you know, we all want to get our kids learning again. You, we can't go forever without kids being back and the socialization of being back with each other and in the classrooms. It's difficult to just do distance learning, but we also got to keep them safe. And so you're, it's a, it, there's no, I don't think one size fits all. And I think we're going to have to watch the numbers very carefully. In our state, <clears throat> our state superintendent of schools is looking at, we had a great discussion with uh, Robert Redfield at, at the CDC. They put out some very good guidelines. We had a good discussion with the vice president, coronavirus task force. We're taking all that advice. Our state superintendent is getting input from all of our local school jurisdictions, some of which are in different situations than others. Some are really good at distance learning and are much more um, you know, uh, populous and some are more rural and don't have the same kinds of issues. So we're probably gonna have some flexibility about what certain school systems do, but I wanna get some kids back in the classroom if we can do it safely, but we don't wanna, I mean, yeah, we don't wanna have kids spreading this infection. So uh, it's, it's, that's an issue that we're gonna be trying to grapple with over the next uh, few weeks. We've asked our local school systems <clears throat> to all submit proposed plans. We're gonna give them some flexibility, but the state's gonna set some guidelines. Yeah, I think people don't fully appreciate how diverse Maryland is. I, I used to live in Maryland uh, yeah. for many years and it's a very diverse state, um, very diverse economy. I, you seem to have made a deliberate decision to try to give a lot of um, control and decision-making down to local authorities in the state to try to tailor, to tailor sort of the response based on local needs, local customs, local resources. Is, is that tr the case here? Well, you know, it's what the uh, it's what the federal government was recommending. And they're all talking about county by county now instead of state by state. Right. And in our state, all of our local governments requested authority and flexibility. Um, we have some very large jurisdictions. We have a couple of them with close to a million people in the population, larger than some states. Um, and some are very almost urban or very uh, you know, uh, populated suburban, some are very rural, small counties, they all have different needs. And there is not a one size fits all. So we set um, a, a floor and a set of standards, you must uh, do these things, we can't do these things. But if a if a local jurisdiction had a higher positivity, like we had in Prince George's County, right outside of Washington, it was up almost 30% positivity, they, they could go slower if they wanted to and have more restrictions if they wanted to. We've now got them down to 6%. It's higher than the rest of the state, but it's way, way down from their peak 90 days ago. Um, How do you think that plays into schools? Because I'm working with uh, Governor Lamont, Lamont, my home state now, yeah. and, and you know, sorry we lost you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll be back. <laughs> and you know, we've thought through how to reopen schools. I think talking to a lot of governors, states haven't necessarily thought through how how they're going to close schools again potentially. Yeah. And so. I'm not, I'm not saying that you've necessarily made decisions about how you would do that. Yeah. But what do you think some of the criteria would be in thinking about that? You know, that's, we, we've been thinking about that. Um, I don't want to think about it, yeah. but again, you have to plan for the worst case scenario. Um, and and, and I, I'd love to get your input and maybe talk after this online or get your thoughts now. When, when we reach certain uh, points, if you have an outbreak or an infection in a school, if, if it reaches a certain level, if we get positivity rates in that area that are over a certain level, you've got to have some breaks to say, you know, we've got to catch this before it spreads. So um, if you're going to open schools, you've got to have a, a breaking mechanism, I think, to stop it, stop the spread and keep the kids safe. But um, I'm sure you're going to come up with some good suggestions for us. Um, well, you know, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a challenging situation heading into the fall because we are likely to see outbreaks in the schools. Um, we, we don't fully understand this virus in the setting of kids. We also don't understand what it's going to look like when it spreads concomitantly with flu and people start to get co-infected. And so I think it's very important to get kids back in the classroom. I know you agree, even for a brief period of time, if we can get them back, get them socialized, get them learning with their new classes. If we do have to go to a distance model, that's going to have been important to get them together for a brief period of time. It also but, impacts the economy because we've got, you know, parents that, uh, that, that, that kind of stay home with the kids and can't get back into the workplace. Right. Um, there's so many different factors to look at. I want to. We have um, some questions coming in Good. from uh, from Twitter, so I want to. Uh, I want to get to that pretty soon. But um, oh, thank you. I got my questions. Um, 
you, you tweeted recently um, about your five-year anniversary um, from finishing chemotherapy. And I, I remember that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those, you remember those anniversaries, you, you, right? You never forget that last yeah. visit. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's poignant because when you're five years out, as you know, there's a presumption that you've sort of beaten your cancer. It's not right. going to come back. Um, and I, let me interrupt and say, I postponed my PET scan because it was in the middle of the pandemic. So I was supposed to go get it April 1st and I waited several months because of the overloaded hospital. So you were stuff. really past the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. I didn't know that detail. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, you had, you had cancer obviously later in life. You were at sort of an epical moment in your career yeah. having, having uh, been a private businessman and then going- I'd, I'd only been governor for five months. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, you know, how do you think, do you think it shaped the way you think about public service in a different way? Did it put you on a different sort of path? I think it, I mean, I'm sure it impacted you that way, Scott, after going through it, but it made me realize the, you know, the things that are important in life. And, and I got the, the chance to meet so many other fellow cancer, you know, patients who are going through much tougher battles than my own and their families and what they went through. And yeah, you know, it's, it did change me. I'm, I'm, I'm much more empathetic. And I think I, you know, I've got a new calling in life, regardless of whether I'm governor or not, I'm going to stay involved in, in helping, uh, you know, raise money and raise awareness and, until we find a cure to some of these terrible diseases. So I, some questions from Twitter, if okay. I may. <laughs> so um, they're not going to be as good as yours. <laughs> <laughs> They'll probably be better than mine. Crowdsourcing is always better than, uh, than what I can come up with. Um, so people can be better prepared in the fall. At what point do you think Maryland might consider rolling back some of the reopening? Um, or you know, shutting down certain aspects of business again. How have you thought about that? Yeah, so our goal would be to try to keep business open in the economy until we, in, unless it's absolutely necessary. Since we've been aggressive on masking and distancing and putting restrictions on capacity in place, and since our state has been following the rules, luckily, um, we've been doing massive amounts of testing now. We're doing two and a half times more than what we were doing last month. So our number of cases is slowly uh, ratcheting up, but our positivity is actually not. Right. Our hospitalizations are good, our ICUs are good, our death rate is down. So we're, we watch all of these numbers on a daily basis. They all are trending in the right direction, unlike most other states. But as soon as we start to see uh, numbers that don't look good, it's going to cause us to you know, take whatever actions are necessary. We saw some concerning and alarming numbers with young people uh, under 35. And uh, you know, we put some guidance out to try to crack down on what we think some of those activities are with our local health departments. Um, and if we if we feel like we have to do something, I'm not going to hesitate to just like we didn't on the on the way down. But my goal is to try to keep the economy safely open because the economic crisis is is uh, nearly as bad as, or just as bad as the health crisis. Right. Have you seen any? You you were showing me the uh, rising positivity rate among young people relative yeah. to the general population. Have you seen any impact yet from the actions or still too early? Still too early. So, uh, you know, we never fully opened bars the way a number of other right. uh, states did. We, we have only seated, distanced, capacity restricted, but still young people are gravitating to these bars. Not everybody was following the rules. They're going to parties. And uh, our, our, for people over 35, we're at like a 3% and something, 3 point something infection. It's almost twice that. It's 6 point something among people over. So it's still much lower than it was. We peaked uh, at 26%. 90 days ago, uh, but it's um, still concerning that there's a little bit of a gap. Have you looked at data on the number of people coming in from some of the hotspot states? I know New York, obviously, a big flow from Florida. What does it look like? In we're the state? seeing some of that, and there's okay. some surrounding states that are a little higher than us, some of our border states, and uh, we're seeing some activity at the beaches and Delaware beaches. We're having some issues crossing over into the Maryland beaches. We're seeing people come up from some of the southern states. It was happening from New York and, and New Jersey back, back when they were hot. Now we're seeing southern states come up. But you can't close your borders, and uh, but we're keeping an eye. We're, we're we have travel advisor advisories of people are coming in from. We're advising them not to travel to some of those states, and if they do, that they should get tested and they should, you know, watch their symptoms and and try to self quarantine. I mean, obviously, you can put in place some um, limitations on people traveling from other states. You saw what New York did with a, a mandatory quarantine if you're coming in from certain hotspot states. Is that more difficult to do in Maryland? Because I think it's, it's much more difficult for anybody to enforce, but I think we're, it's not as big of an issue for us okay. yet, but we're keeping an eye on that. And we're certainly putting out advisories and, and, and warnings and trying to message to people that they ought to be cautious. 
So another question from Twitter, what are you thinking about with respect to how voting is going to unfold in the fall, given the extenuating circumstances? So during the height of the pandemic, we were supposed to have a, a, a primary right at the peak when we were I remember that. massive, yeah. uh, massive infection rate. And I signed an executive order postponing the primary, moving it a couple of months later to June. And we allowed for um, vote by mail. And they only opened up a few precincts. They screwed up the vote by mail. The State Board of Elections did. They mailed the wrong ballots. They mailed uh, Spanish-speaking ballots to English speakers. They, they got the wrong districts. It was a disaster. A bunch of people showed up at the handful of precincts and had four-hour waits. It was, you know, so this time we had to have all of the above. We're going to mail out applications for ballots, to every, mail-in ballots for everybody. We're going to have early voting, safely, distance, and we're going to open the polls in case somebody comes to vote. But we're going to encourage uh, doing the absentee ballots, which we've been doing here for 20 years. Um, and we're going to encourage early voting and people being safe. We don't want to have crowded polling places right. and we're going to watch it. We're going to have PPE and, and, and keep, try to keep everybody safe. But, uh, you know, you can't do one or the other. We're going to try to do all the above. So I, I've been wanting to ask you this question for a long time. And this is my sort of FDA. Uh, yeah, your FDA hat. Wonka hat. <laughs> Wonka hat. You, you talk a lot about the story of securing those tests from South Korea um, with the help of your wife. Um, what, what kind of steps did you have to go through in terms of getting regulatory sign off and working with some federal officials to be able to bring those tests in and then be able to use them? Um, and and how'd, you, how'd you do it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, how'd well, you... <laughs> well, yeah, so it was quite, somewhat of a nightmare. You know, when we first, I mean, you know, early on, and I talk about this in the book, early on, there was not enough testing anywhere. Right. So I, I think in early March, uh, there were like 2,800 tests done in the whole country. By end of March, there was you know very little testing available in any of the states. And that's when we started reaching out. I mean, I think the, the president at one point said, you know, states are on their own. You got to do your own testing. I'm not going to stand on the street corners giving out tests. Um, states were scrambling around. There was not enough available testing. Right. And so we were able to, we spent 22 days negotiating with eight of our state agencies with uh, this a company in South Korea. We acquired these, uh, these tests. FDA had then given flexibility to the states to, to uh, be able to uh, use things that, and, and, you know, that were not through the normal process, which is how we did it. But we kept it pretty under wraps because there were some issues with uh, uh, the, the federal government had, had kind of confiscated some supplies that were coming in to other states, including Massachusetts. We didn't want that to happen. So we had to, we had to work through the channels, but we, we kept it sort of low pro profile. The end of the story is it's a big centerpiece of our long-term testing strategy. We built a state-of-the-art lab with robotics. We're using, you know, we use tens of thousands of these tests on our, on our hottest spots. Uh, we're using two or 3,000 a day in our state lab at our state university. And we have a supply to take us all the way through to the end of November, um, unless these slow labs uh, that are happening everywhere else. If we have to double up our production, we may have to acquire more of these tests uh, what's, um, and, and use them up faster than we anticipate. What's flowing through the, those testing centers that you stood up? Uh, is it from the public health labs that you're... Yeah, yeah so when we go in, we're, we're doing nursing homes. Okay. We had an outbreak in our poultry industry. When, when we really need to get the test results that are important, those are the hour the state is doing these ones. Those are the ones we're sending to our lab. There, we also have 230 other testing centers that are going through you know, all the normal process that go through Quest or LabCorp or all these other different facilities. So it's a part of our, it's one part of our long-term testing strategy. So it's part of, so the tests that go through those labs is part of the public, mostly the public health yeah. surveillance and, the, and when you're surging. When we need them to, faster. Right. So ours are 24 to 48 hours. And right now everybody else is slowing down to about 10 days and in some cases longer. Are you surprised that we're still facing these kinds of testing shortages I, six, seven months into this? I am, and I'm really worried about it. So with the spikes in other states, they're overloading the lab capacity, these, these national labs that were doing a great job, by the way. We were, we were utilizing them. They were doing a lot of our testing every month, just in the past several weeks since, or since the spikes came up. They've come to a halt because they got too many tests coming in from around the country. Um, it's, it's caused us to have to ramp up our own internal testing, and we're probably going to now, we thought we had a four-month supply. We're probably going to use them up in two. And probably order some more. <laughs> so, so another another plane another load. Got to go get another plane load. <laughs> um, you know the the um, it seems like what's happening, and I, you might have more insight into this. That the commercial labs are basically the only swing capacity we have in this country nationally, and yeah. they're swinging more of that capacity into hotspots. So they're pulling it away from some that's of exactly this. Exactly what's happening. Okay. Uh, but they're even slow on those hotspots. I, I think that's a place where the federal government could possibly help. 
Um, you know, they did a good job on ramping up with the Defense Production Act on ventilators, which they, they really produced. We had none. They produced them rapidly. If the federal government helps these labs boost up capacity, um, it could help all the states and all these private labs and help people get more tests, get it done faster. So we don't have to do these crazy creative things like doing, you know, finding our own or building our own or, you know, doing these outside of the box things. And, and you know, they, they kind of, it's helping these businesses grow and in utilizing the private sector, which I think is something administration has been pretty good at. Yeah, you know, it's a question whether or not the private labs are making the capital investments that they need to just sort I of think that's a problem. dramatically increase the capacity, their throughput, but part Maybe of the, the federal bottom, government could help. Right, I, my perception is, and I, I see what you you think of this, is that part of the bottleneck also is just hiring because to, to run a lab, true. you need lab techs. You we had skilled. the same problem in our state lab. So we had these sophisticated machines. We had this huge stockpile of very sensitive, very rapid tests. We had a flow and a demand. It was hiring the people so how that you had the it? skills. It was difficult. I mean, that was, that was one, there's so many parts of it, finding the swabs, the transport mediums, the tubes, the, the reagents, all these different parts and the people and the, the, the talent, that was, that's a hard part everywhere. We've got a shortage of the, of the people with the right qualifications. So there's a lot of questions about school. Clearly it's on people's minds. Yeah, I mean, and, everybody's concerned about it. Right, Get, and getting the kids back into the classroom, but also when the decision is going to be made to close schools if, there, if we do have another epidemic this fall. Do you envision that being a state-led decision or do you envision at first you might have local districts making decisions because there's outbreaks in local parts of the state to close schools for a period of time before you reach a sort of state level decision? So that's a good question. We'll probably set a state, we're gonna, we haven't come out with our final plan yet. Our state board of education, and by the way, they're independent and autonomous from the governor, but the state board of, uh, of education uh, put out a plan about a month ago and they're going to come out with some more guidance um, this week in fact maybe as soon as tomorrow um, and they're going to set some parameters but they're going to give flexibility the, the local boards of education have real authority and autonomy as do our county governments to, to make certain decisions on their own um, but they're not they're, they're going to do it within certain parameters i think um, um, we're going to allow some if, if somebody has a critical situation it really the local school board will have the ability to put those um, those fire, those breaks in the chain and say, hey, our health department, our school board says we got an emergency situation. They shouldn't wait to have to run it up the chain to get the state board of ed to take a vote. They should be able to, you know, put the brakes on. What are some of the things that schools are doing here in Maryland to try to um, prevent outbreaks, create a safe environment? You know, I, so we, we just have, we're waiting, we have until, they have until August 14th to put uh, the 24 jurisdictions right. to submit their plans. I think we have about five or six who have submitted plans, the larger jurisdictions. A lot of them are, are, are leaning more towards, um, you know, uh, online um, learning and as opposed to getting back in the classrooms. I think many of our more rural districts want to get kids back in the classroom more. And I think some of them are going to be looking at hybrids and or staggered where you're coming in for a couple of days and sw switching out days so we don't have all the kids in so you can distance better. Uh, but we haven't seen all the recommendations and we haven't seen the final uh, decisions from the state board. So you think an important principle is to try to de-densify schools a little bit? I think you've got to, de uh, you, you can't have all those kids jammed in those small right. areas, right? So how do you spread them out? Uh, maybe you've got to do some staggering. Maybe they come in for, you know, two or three days, then they go back and do some distance learning. As you said, get them back, socialize, get them back in the classroom, but maybe they're not there every single day. They can go follow up and bring in the other kids the next day. I'm, I'm not sure yet. There's smarter people than me that are education experts and health experts that are going to be making, you know, recommendations. So when do you think you'll have, because obviously school, school year is approaching. Yeah, they, um, they, they the final uh, decisions and the final plans are supposed to be in on August 14th, okay. but I think we're going to have some guidance this week. Okay. I think a lot, what a lot of states are looking at also, states that can't necessarily de-densify the school, and obviously it's easier in some districts than yeah, others, that's very true. depending on what the physical infrastructure is, is just keeping kids in the same cohort. So if you saw what the European nations did, they had pods, yeah. the same 10 kids stay together the entire day. And that certainly works in, in certain schools and in certain areas. And I think some of the local boards are looking at that. Do you think you'd see masks being worn in public schools? I think you have to. I mean, I don't see how you get around it. What what is it, the adherence in this state look like to masks? The adherence is, uh, adherence to masks is pretty good in our state. So um, you know I don't know why it's become such a political issue. 
Um, you know, uh, I, I'm glad to see the president now wearing a mask. And he said it's patriotic to wear a mask yesterday. Um, I, I know that most of his administration has been saying that masking is important. I know you've been a big proponent of that. We had our masks on. We just took them off for this interview here. Um, but most of the people in my state are following it. I think it's one of the reasons why our numbers are down instead of skyrocketing up like some of the states where they won't wear, won't wear the masks. It seems to me that it's one of the few things that we can do collectively to try to prevent large pretty easy. epidemics this, <laughs> right, for this fall and preserve what's most important to us, sending our yeah. kids to school, restarting our businesses. Well, so we've started up 98% of our economy and our numbers are down. And I keep saying we want to keep Maryland open for business. And one of the simple things you can do is wear a mask. If you don't follow the distancing and you don't wear your mask, there's a chance the economy could shut down again and people could lose their jobs and we're going to have people getting sick. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Have you looked at data in the state in terms of what the adherence is? Do you have a sense? Of I, I don't know if we have exact numbers, okay. but I can just, you can just walk around anecdotally and see that a lot of people here are wearing masks. Of course, I'm in a very liberal democratic state, even though I'm a Republican governor and, um, and the, the attitudes may be a little different than they may be in some Southern states. And I noticed all your, all your staff's wearing masks and they're in the demographic that's going to infect us. They're, these, they're these 25 th to 35 A bunch of these 20 something, <laughs> 30 something people, thank God they're wearing masks because they probably had parties and bars. And... <laughs> um, in, um, in executing your plan, Maryland, Maryland Strong Roadmap to Recovery, you sought guidance from a, a wide variety of stakeholders. I was fortunate, as yeah, you said, to you. be included as, as well as a lot of prominent people in the state. Um, this is sort of a perk of having Johns Hopkins and other great institutions yeah. here in the state. You also brought in business leaders like the CEO of Under Armour, who's also headquartered here in, in Maryland. What what perspectives were you hoping to capture and what do you think you that contributed to it was ability? huge um first of all thank you again for serving um we, we had a coronavirus recovery uh, team response team that was made up of folks like the former fda commissioner dr scott gottlieb um we we had uh some of the top doctors from johns hopkins we have great medical facilities here in state of maryland we're the headquarters of the fda uh nih we have Johns Hopkins, we have, uh, you know, the University of Maryland, MedStar Health, all these great folks. We, we put all these smart docs on the team. We also brought in top business leaders because we wanted both perspectives back in our economy back safely. We had, you know, we had the chairman of uh, Marriott, which is headquartered here. We had the chairman of uh, Under Armour. We had a number of other leaders and we had these great discussions on a, on a weekly basis, getting input about on the health side, on the business side. And it was in every one of the decisions that I made um, I can tell you that was based on input I got from uh, people much smarter than me and uh, who knew more about business and knew more about the health side. And uh, we had to make decisions pretty quickly. There's no time to debate or to, to wait around or pass legislation. It's like we had to make decisions quickly. And I wanted the best, smartest people around me and get the best advice so I can make those decisions. And it was, it was very uh, helpful to the entire response to the pandemic. How do you feel now heading into the fall? Because in some respects, we know more, um, we've had time to prepare, but in other respects, if we do have to shut down again, we're doing it on the heels of a more weakened economy. And yeah. We've been through a lot. I'm uh, very concerned. Uh, on the one hand, we're much better prepared. We were shocked and we were hit. We had nothing when we started this, right? We had to build, build an entire infrastructure. We didn't have to, we had the state of Maryland had never acquired uh, you know, swabs and masks and PPE, and we didn't have to deal with all these things that we've been dealing with for six months. Um, but now we've uh, built lab capacity, we've built 6,000 more hospital beds, we've got plenty of ventilators, we've uh, added surge capacity and built field hospitals, and we're prepared in that respect if thing, something flares up. Um, we've also got our economy back on track, and we're doing better than I think, you know, most of the states in the country, better than, the, you know, almost 30% better than the rest of the country. Uh, but I'm really concerned that that, you know, that could change uh, in a moment if uh, this thing gets back to the way it was. And, and it looks like that's, that's a possibility. So uh, I, I'm worried about the fall, uh, but I think we're better prepared. Uh, but I'm very concerned about another shutdown and about another flare up. Do you, th you feel like the state's been able to stockpile a lot of the equipment that we didn't have? I I'm not going to say we're not going to uh, have shortages again right. because other people are having it all around the country, but I think we're not going to be as completely caught off guard as everybody was the first time. I saw a statistic from a New York City hospital that th their, their pandemic plans had them using two times the normal amount of PPE 
and they bur were burning through about 25 times the normal amount. So I think a lot it's of the unbelievable. plans we had on the shelf, we underestimated what the true impact would be. Well, think about it. It wasn't just the federal government or the state government, local government, the hospital systems, the hospitals. Nobody really was prepared for anything like this in the private sector, in the public sector. And now we've learned a lot on whether or not we're going to be prepared for the next time or not. We at least know more uh, than we did the first right. time. So you're headed the National Governors Association. You think that states are going to behave differently going forward in terms of making their own preparations and not being dependent upon the federal government? I sure hope so. I mean, I think uh, I think the federal government needs to be more prepared next time. I think the states need to be prepared better next time. Uh, and I think the hospital systems, almost everybody needs to learn from this experience because uh, we can't be caught like this again. So uh, Twitter question from um, Shelly uh, Nazar, the head of the National um, Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, first thanking you for your leadership and um, wanting me to ask you um, what you make of the recent uptick in cases. And you and I talked about that a little bit, yeah. how concerned you are, you know, what you're looking to do to try to yeah. combat that. Well, so in, in our state, um, I think uh, yesterday or the day before we did 20, uh, almost 29,000 tests and our cases went up, but they actually went up at a slower rate. So we right. went when you move from 15,000 case uh, tests to 30,000, you, your numbers should double. They didn't. They, 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 they went up at a slower rate. So our, if, if we're concerned that there are more cases, but when the positivity rate, the percentage is going down, it's still a pretty good sign. So I'm not to say that we're not concerned about rising cases and dismiss it, but those other metrics are the ones we look at. The positivity rate, hospitalizations, ICUs, and deaths, which are lagging by you know a, a little bit of time, but we're uh, so we're we're cautiously uh, watching those numbers. You see testing continuing to build, heading into the fall in this state. I think we're going to continue to build testing. It's growing at a rapid pace. I think we're going to need to ramp up our own testing because of the slowdowns. But I think we're all going to be back to this testing problem again because we haven't addressed the issues. It's not reassuring. <laughs> um, and you, but right now you're able to get testing into the places where you feel that there's. We've opened up 230 okay. uh, testing centers across the state, almost any corner of the state you can go, and um, and we're we're we went from almost zero testing to you know almost 30, 25, 30 thousand a day, mm -hmm. uh, but we're very concerned about the slow labs, which is why we're we're probably going to have to do more of them ourselves with our Korean tests. And is there more ability to? create more lab capacity with those? We're, we're ramping up. I think we're hiring twice as many people and we're probably going to use up these things at a faster rate than and we you're anticipated. Able to, you're able to we're probably going to have to get some more. You're able to find a labor right now to do that. We have. It's been really tough, but I think we've doubled the staff just in the past uh, week or two. You know, I just want to, we're, we're running up on time. So I want to um, give you a few minutes to close this out here in terms of what you, uh, what you think some of the most important lessons learned through this episode? And what are, you know, you're giving advice to other governors across the National Governors Association. What kinds of things are you telling um, governors in states that haven't been hit yet? Because um, this is a state that has been hit along with the whole Northeast, really, and was able to bring down the virus levels to sort of low levels. I mean, we really crushed the virus in these states. What are you telling other governors uh, in terms of what they can do, the ones that haven't yet been affected by this? Well, first of all, let me just say um, I, I've been really proud to uh, be able to chair this group of governors and I, governors on both sides of the aisle, I think, have been really stepped. They've really stepped up on the front lines of battling this crisis and uh, been in really difficult positions. But I think they've all in different ways tried to do a, a great job to protect their citizens and keep their economy safe. It's been, it's been a challenge. Um, but I think I've, I've led 40 some calls with all the nation's governors, which is a lot, just over a few month period, more than probably they've done in 10 years. Um, and we've also had lots of individual discussions back and forth with uh, one, one, two governors, uh, Democrats and Republicans about how are you dealing with this? And ha have you seen this issue? Or just one-on-one -on -one questions, groups of governors and regions cooperating. And, and so it's not, you know, I, I, it's far be it from me to just say, hey, here's how we've done it. Let me give you advice. Uh, we share best practices and, and input from one another. We give each other advice on almost a daily basis or ask each other questions. And the collaboration has been terrific. And I'll say, you know, with all the divisive politics today that you see, and sometimes it seems like in Washington, you know, it's all Democrats, Republicans, and nothing, you know, seems to get done sometimes in Congress. 
Um, uh, the governors really work together in a bipartisan way and throughout this pandemic, it's been amazing. Um, and I've learned from some of my colleagues and I think I've been able to share some of the things. I, some, I think early and aggressive action, not hesitating. Sometimes, hey, you may make the wrong decision, but waiting is definitely gonna be a mistake. Right. So taking a, get the best input uh, from the experts, make the quick decisions and don't hesitate and don't worry about the politics. People are gonna be mad. Uh, people on both sides are not gonna like what you, whatever decision you make. I, I don't care about the politics. I'm, I'm just trying to make the best decisions uh, for the people in my state. And I think most governors, that's, that's what they are doing and what they should do. We've seen a, a very deliberate decision by the federal government to leave a lot of decision making to the states, and we haven't seen a sort of a national approach to this, if you will. At times we have, there's, but in, in most respects, um, the White House sort of plans were encapsulating what was already underway in the states and the private sector. Do you, do you see more collaboration um, among governors to create sort of regional responses happening now as a consequence of this? Is this going to be a sort of a new federalism, if you will, where... It's interesting. I'm, it's possible. Um, look, I, I think there, to a certain extent, uh, the governors are on the front lines and it was OK for us to be able right. to have the flexibility to make decisions, just like I was talking about with the counties. Um, but there were certain issues where the federal government could have played more of a role, you know, with a national strategy that would have been helpful. Like testing. Like testing. So we wouldn't have, you know, 50 states competing with one another and the federal government in a very constrained market for things that we desperately needed um, all over the globe. Um, but um, having some flexibility is good. I'm all for states' rights and states having more power and states being able to do things on their own. Um, so, but I think there has been way more uh, cooperation with regional compacts with states um, than you've ever seen before. And I think the governors have, all, have also stepped up and been more visible and played more of a role. And people are like, hey, these guys are actually getting things done. They used to be, you, you, you see a lot about what this, the senators and the congressmen are talking about in Washington, but uh, now they're saying, hey, these governors are actually doing things every day out in their states. Well, Governor, I want to thank you for your time. We're yeah, coming up you. on the end of our uh, our time here thank today. You very thank much. you for your leadership and uh, your time here. Well, today. we can't shake hands, but thank you very much. <laughs> an I, air, an air, an yeah, air bump. <laughs> I, I very much enjoyed it. And I appreciate it. I having having us on today. Thanks a lot. Thanks.